Well, good morning. My name is Adam, if we haven't had the chance to meet, and it's uh, wonderful to have you with us today. Now, I'd like to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever seen something that stopped you in your tracks? Have you ever seen something that took your breath away? Now, men, if you're sitting next to your wives, it might be a good idea to turn to her and say, it's you every day, baby. Just a suggestion. (laughs) Now, this is certainly one of the the moments in my life when my wife, Molly, walked down the aisle. She walked through those doors, and I was standing just back there, and, and when I got to see her for the first time, it took my breath away. Another moment was when I saw my kids for the first time. They were a little bit goopy and gross, but it was love at first sight. Another view that took my breath away was watching the sunrise from the top of Mount Sinai. In 2010, I went on a study tour to Egypt, Jordan, and Israel, and we got to hike up Mount Sinai five, six hours, and then slept under the stars on top for the night with the Bedouins making us dinner. And then in the morning, we got up and we watched the sunrise. It was incredible. A few other views that take my breath away are this one, or this one more recently, or this one. Mm. Get off the screen or we're all going to get hungry. What about you? Have you ever seen something, stopped you in your tracks, took your breath away? Well, today in chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah is given a vision that not just stops him in his tracks, not just takes his breath away, but brings him totally undone. Because Isaiah is given a vision of God. Now, we are in a sermon series at the moment called A Light Has Dawned. For the weeks leading up to Christmas, we are exploring the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, if you're not familiar with Isaiah, let me uh, catch you up a little bit. Isaiah was written 3,000 years ago, about 700 years before Jesus came onto the scene. But Isaiah powerfully and profoundly points to Jesus. There are a number of promises and predictions and prophecies about his coming. Now, Isaiah himself was a prophet. He was a spokesperson. He delivered God's message to God's people. And he mainly spoke to the people of Judah in the south. And his message was mainly one of judgment and hope. He warned the people of God's impending judgment because of their complacency and their corruption. And yet he also promised them a better day, that God's judgment would not be the end of the story. Now today, Isaiah brings us back to the beginning. He gives us his origin story, how he got started as a prophet, how he got involved in ministry. And what we see is that he got involved in ministry at a very important juncture and time for the people of God. This is what we read in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died. Not Isaiah, Uzziah. The Bible loves to keep us on our toes when it comes to names. Now, King Uzziah was one of the better kings of Judah. He reigned for a long time, about 52 years. Now, I don't know how many prime ministers we've had in Australia in the last 52 years, but it's definitely not one. We average closer to one a year. Anyway, perhaps a modern equivalent is closer to Queen Elizabeth. She's reigned for almost 70 years. King Uzziah reigned for a long time, and it was a peaceful reign. Life was good under King Uzziah. The people were safe and comfortable and prosperous. He was a much-loved king. Now, he wasn't a perfect king. Towards the end of his life, he became prideful, and he did things at the temple, took prerogatives that he shouldn't have taken, and God disciplined him for that. But still, when he died, the people of Judah were in shock. One of the the leaders that they had only ever known had died. And, And so there was fear and uncertainty and anxiety about the future. Now, when you add on to this, the fact that in the north, the Assyrian Empire was growing and becoming stronger and flexing its muscles and invading lands and laying waste to other cities, and it looked like Israel and Judah were next on the list. 
you can see that this was a time of great fear, great uncertainty, and great anxiety. And it's against this backdrop that Isaiah is called to be a prophet. It's against this backdrop that Isaiah is given a vision of God. Now, you might be wondering, this is great, this is wonderful, but what does this have to do with me? How does Isaiah's vision of God impact my life today in in Australia? Well, the fact is, I cannot think of anything more relevant than for us to have a clear vision of God. To see God in all of his glory and in all of his holiness. In fact, if there was ever a time that we needed to know how big God is, then surely that time is now. I mean, isn't it true that we also are facing a little bit of uncertainty and anxiety and fear about the future? I mean, I'm not sure what worries and baggage you've carried in today. I'm not sure what's weighing you down. Maybe it's personal circumstances. Maybe it's the state of the world. Maybe, if you're honest, you've walked in here today and your worries seem big and God seems small. Maybe your problems seem overwhelming and God seems impotent and absent. Well, this vision of Isaiah is going to give us what we need. It's going to give us proper perspective to see God as he really is. Not small and insignificant, but great and glorious. And if you're not a Christian here today, someone's invited you to church, then this vision of God that Isaiah is given, it will show you what it looks like to meet the real God, what he is really like and what he really requires of you. So let's dive into this vision together and we'll explore it under three main headings. We'll look at it from Isaiah's perspective and we'll talk about what he sees, verses one to four, what he feels, verses 5 to 7, and then what he does in verses 8 to 13. Now, we'll spend most of our time on the first couple of points, what he sees and what he feels, and then we'll touch on what he does at the end. So let's begin. Number one, what he sees. And very simply, what Isaiah sees is a great and a glorious God. Here's how he begins. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, if you came to me after the service and you said, Adam, last night I saw the Lord. I saw God. Now, I I won't doubt that God can and does do this, but I've got to admit, I will be a little bit skeptical. Because to see God is a very rare occurrence. In fact, the Bible says that to see God is deadly. God said to Moses in Exodus 33, no one may see me and live. God is like the sun and we are like a tissue. To get too close would consume us because God is holy and we are not. And this is why Isaiah didn't seem to see God completely because he doesn't go on to describe God totally. He only shares with us a few different details. For example, firstly, he says that God was high and exalted, seated on a throne. Now remember, King Uzziah has just fallen off his throne, and so Isaiah is given a vision of the God who cannot and will not ever be removed from his throne. The king over everything and everyone. And this is the point of what Isaiah goes on to say. He says he also saw that the train of his robe filled the temple. In other words, if just the train of his robe, if just the hem of his robe, as it were, filled the temple, then this God cannot be contained by the temple. He is bigger than the temple. And and this is what the seraphim, these mysterious winged creatures, literally the burning ones, this is what they cry out in verse 3. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's not just the temple that is full of God's glory, but the whole earth resounds with his glory. Now notice these seraphim, these angelic creatures, that as they surround God's throne, they're not just kind of floating around disinterested. No, they're praising God. Because when you're in the presence of something praiseworthy, you cannot help but praise it. For example, I've never been there myself, but I imagine if you were standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon 
you wouldn't just kind of shrug your shoulders. You begin to praise it. Look how big it is. Look how wide it is. Look how deep it is. And this is what these seraphim are doing. They're praising God. Now, what are they saying about God? Well, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Now, when we want to emphasize something, we will use single descriptor words like fastest and greatest and strongest and so on and so forth. But the Hebrew language doesn't work like this. When the Hebrew language, which the Old Testament was written in, wants to emphasize something, it uses repetition. So, for example, in the Old Testament, a really deep pit is literally pit, pit. Pure gold is literally gold, gold. We might say in 2021, the Brisbane Broncos were bad, bad. (laughs) Now here, in verse 3, an attribute of God is repeated for emphasis. Not just twice, but three times. The only time in the entire Bible that an attribute of God is repeated three times in succession. See, God's not just holy, or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy. Holy, holy. In other words, holiness is God's defining characteristic. Now, I wonder what you think about that. I wonder if that's somehow disappointing to you or maybe off-putting to you. Because when you think about the word holy, you might think about boring, stuffy, uptight religion. When in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. The word holy, as I'm sure you know, it means separate or set apart or distinct. In other words, when we say that God is holy, we don't just mean that he's a a bigger, stronger, smarter version of us. No, we're saying that God is absolutely distinct and different from us. That God is in a different category to us. That he is higher than us, greater than us, stronger than us kinder than us, wiser than us, more loving than us, more just than us. He is superlative to us in every single way. And this is why when God descends and draws near, as he does here with Isaiah, it is actually a terrifying and traumatic experience. I mean, the whole building is shaking, the temple is filling with smoke, and this seraphim, the burning ones, these winged creatures, even they are covering their eyes. And so let me just ask you, is your God as big as Isaiah's God? Is the vision of God in your mind as big as the God in Isaiah's vision? If it's not, then your God is too small. And your God will not be able to sustain you through the ups and the downs and the difficulties of life. I mean, think about it. Isaiah is staring down the barrel of an uncertain future. Isaiah is dead. Assyria is coming. And so what does God give him? Doesn't give him a pep talk, doesn't give him money, doesn't give him a self-help book, doesn't even tell him to just believe in himself. You got this, Isaiah, you can do it. Now God does the opposite. God tells Isaiah to look beyond himself. God gives Isaiah a vision of himself as he truly is. Big, glorious, holy and majestic. And this is what Isaiah needed in his day and this is what you and I need today as well. So let me ask you again, what are your worries? What is weighing you down? Do your worries seem big and does God seem small? I pray and I hope that you will allow this vision of God in Isaiah 6 to fill you with fresh hope and deeper faith. To fill you with fresh confidence in the holy, holy, holy God. Not necessarily because he's going to solve everything and fix everything the way that you would like him to. God's not just going to make your worries dissolve or your problems disappear, at least not in this life. But I hope and pray that you will put your trust in the God who knows more than you, who sees more than you, and who holds you no matter what you're going through. It it reminds me a little bit, and again, I'm sorry to use an illustration from Chronicles of Narnia, but it reminds me of a scene from Prince Caspian, which is one of the, the books in the Narnia series. Lucy, one of the little girls who's been to Narnia and she's left and she's come back again and and she's talking with Aslan, the king of Narnia, the Christ figure. And this is how the conversation goes. 
Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one. Not because you are, she said. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. See, is your view of God growing bigger or smaller? If you are growing, you will find God to be growing in your life as well. The first thing Isaiah sees in this vision is a great and a glorious God. And this leads us next to what Isaiah feels. And it is a painful but purifying experience. Look at what Isaiah says as he enters into the the presence of this holy, holy, holy God. Verse 5. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. When Isaiah enters into the presence of this holy God, he is saying, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. I am coming undone. I am falling apart at the seams. You know, we'll say about someone, they've just got it all together. Well, this is the opposite of that experience. Isaiah is falling apart. He's coming undone in the presence of this holy, holy, holy God. And Isaiah is not alone in this fact. There are others in the Bible who experience this when they enter into the presence of God. For example, when God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind, Job, the most righteous man on the earth, we're told. This is how he responds. My ears had heard of you. I'd listened to a lot of sermons about you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You see, before the presence of God becomes still waters and green pastures, it is actually traumatic and terrifying. Now, why is this the case? Well, firstly, we know from our own experience that to be in the presence of greatness can be terrifying. For example, I remember a number of years ago, I went to a conference in Sydney, and one of the main speakers at this conference was John Piper. Now, if you're not familiar with him, John Piper is kind of a big deal in the Reformed world. He's written a squillion books and, and had a big impact and Anyway, there was one evening after dinner where we had a bit of time before the next session, and so some of us decided to go to the pub for a drink. So we went along, and I left a little bit early so I could go back and check out the bookstore again because I've got a problem. Um, But anyway, just confession is good for the soul. Um, Walking back into the conference center, and who's kind of walking right up the, the aisle towards me? John Piper. Now, initially, I got a bit excited. I was kind of going to stop him and talk to him and ask him some questions. But then as he got closer, he looked up and he looked directly at me. And I've got to admit, it unnerved me a little bit. It made me a little bit frightened. I'm thinking, man, can he smell the beer on my breath from here? (laughs) And so I looked away and I kept walked straight past him. See, to be in the presence of human greatness can be terrifying. What about to be in the presence of divine greatness. Secondly, to be in the presence of God exposes us. It exposes our goodness, even our goodness to not be that good. It exposes even our strengths to to be weaknesses. I mean, look at what Isaiah says in verse 5. It says, for I am a man of unclean lips, And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now, why does Isaiah talk about his lips? Why not his feet or his hands or his nose or whatever else? Why lips? Well, some would suggest that it's because Isaiah is a prophet. Now, what does a prophet do? Well, a prophet is a public speaker, a public communicator. Isaiah's lips are his pride and joy. They're one of his greatest strengths. Kind of like the way a surgeon feels about their hands or a sprinter feels about their legs. It's central to his identity and yet in the light of God's perfection, even his strengths feel like weaknesses. Others suggest that Isaiah mentions lips because in the Bible, our lips are so closely connected to our hearts. It's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Either way, the point is the same. When Isaiah steps into the light of God's presence, 
He not only is given a vision of God, his holiness, his perfection, but he's also given a clear vision of himself, his sinfulness, his dirtiness, and he is undone. It's kind of like the story I heard about this picture earlier this week. That there is the captain of the England soccer team, Bobby Moore, receiving the World Cup trophy from Queen Elizabeth in 1966. Now you can see there that the Queen is wearing these beautiful white gloves. Now when Bobby Moore was interviewed afterwards, he was asked, what was it like to receive the trophy from the Queen? And he said all he could think about was the Queen's white gloves. He was petrified of making them dirty, of staining them. He, see, he was filthy. He just played a full game of soccer and he didn't want to stain the Queen's white gloves. There's actually YouTube footage as he approaches the podium. He's like wiping his hands on the tablecloth as he gets closer and closer to the Queen. Now, when we approach God in his holiness and in his perfection, we actually become painfully aware of our uncleanness of our dirty hands and our dirty lips and our dirty hearts. And that's the painful part of meeting God. We are exposed by his holiness. It's a little bit like uh, the Leonard Cohen song where he's saying there's a crack, a crack in everything. When we encounter God, the only whole and put together being in the universe, we realize the crack in our own hearts. But it's a bit like Leonard Cohen went on to sing. He said, there's a crack, a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets in. And this is exactly what we see happen for Isaiah. Following his admission of guilt and sinfulness and uncleanness, the light of God's cleansing, purifying forgiveness, it begins to flow into his cracked heart and life. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. Now that's significant. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your place of deepest shame, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And you see, this is the heart of God. This is what God wants for us. The point of Christianity is not just to make you feel really guilty. The point of Christianity is that you would have your guilt and your shame and your sin paid for and cleansed and purified. Now, how does this happen? Well, notice God doesn't just say to Isaiah, it's okay, Isaiah, I forgive you, don't worry about it, it's all good. No, there is an act of cleansing. There is an act of purification. The seraphim take a piece of this coal from the altar, touch it to Isaiah's lips, and it doesn't harm him, but it actually heals him. Now, what's the significance of this? I mean, what's the altar? Well, the altar is the place of sacrifice, the place of forgiveness in the Old Testament. It's where blood was spilled and sin was paid for. And of course, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, it was pointing us to Christ. It was fulfilled in Christ. This is why when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because Jesus was the ultimate sacrificial lamb. His blood was poured out on the altar of the cross. He was given as a once-for-all sacrifice for sin. And there's no seraphim or coal that kind of come to us from the cross, but there is a message, and the message is this. It is finished. Jesus has paid for your sin once and for all. He has achieved it, you receive it. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of Christianity. And this is exactly what Isaiah has discovered here. He has gone from being totally undone to being totally forgiven. And you may have walked in here today weighed down by guilt, shame, worry, anxiety, you can walk out today feeling radically free and radically forgiven, knowing that you belong to the holy, holy, holy God and knowing that he has forgiven you and cleansed you in his son. Now, how do you receive this forgiveness? How do you get in on this? Well, you do what Isaiah did. 
when he was confronted by his sinfulness, by his unworthiness, when he was exposed under the gaze of God, he doesn't run away, he doesn't make excuses, he admits it. He says, woe is me. Literally saying, I deserve judgment. I deserve cursing. And that admission is the only path to to healing and to forgiveness. That admission is what separates Christians from others. I mean, Christians are not better or more virtuous than anyone else. It's just simply that we're honest about ourselves. Think about it this way. Imagine there are five people in a burning building and only one lady says to the fireman below, catch me. And only one lady jumps out of the window. Now, what's the difference between her and the others in the building? It's not that they had different needs. They all had the same need. She was the only one that was willing to trust the one who had a solution. And this is what Isaiah does. This is what every Christian does. We admit our need and we receive our only solution. Now, you might think this is the end of the story. Isaiah receives cleansing, forgiveness, the end. We all lived happily ever after. But you see, that's not the way that an encounter with God works. God does, just, doesn't just leave us the way that he finds us. God doesn't just forgive us and then forget about us. God, incredibly, begins to use us in the world. And this is what we see God do for Isaiah as well. At least to the third thing we see here in this passage, which is what he does. And he is given, he accepts a difficult but hopeful mission. Now, before Isaiah even hears what this mission is, what it entails, he says, here am I, send me. And this shows you the transforming power of grace. I mean, a few moments ago, Isaiah was ruined and undone. Now he's jumping up and down, asking God to use him. A few moments ago, his lips were unclean. Now he is offering to be a spokesperson for God in the world. It's the transforming power of grace. Now, Isaiah's probably going to wish that he held his horses a little bit, at least until he'd heard the job description, because it's a doozy. In fact, it reminds me a little bit of an ad that was once reportedly put in a paper by a man named Ernest Shackleton, an Arctic explorer. Here's what he said. This was his ad, his job description. Men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return, doubtful. Honour and recognition in the event of success. Now that's the kind of job that God gives to Isaiah. Because basically from verses 9 to 13, God says to Isaiah, for the rest of your life, you are going to preach to people who will not listen to you. In fact, your preaching will have a deadening impact upon them, a hardening effect on them. They will be unimpressed by your message. They will be ambivalent towards me, your God, and they will be hostile towards you. They will not respond to you in any way. Good luck with that. Go for it. Not exactly an encouraging job description. Now, though this is difficult for us to wrap our minds around, it actually illustrates an important principle for you and me. See, the people of Judah, their hearts have become so hard to God that even to hear the word of God simply hardened them further. And you see, the word of God is either going to be softening us or hardening us. See, just like the sun both melts the butter and hardens the clay, the word of God is either going to be softening our hearts when we hear it, making us more humble, more receptive, more willing to to love and believe and obey, or it's going to be hardening us, making us more defiant, more ignorant, more rebellious. And unfortunately for Isaiah, his ministry is going to be marked by the latter. And so it's perhaps not surprising that he says, for how long, Lord? How long am I going to have to do this? And God says, until my judgment is complete. See, the people of Judah had turned away from God entirely. And they are going to end up in exile. It will be the collapse of Judah because they have refused to listen to God. Now, it's a difficult mission, but it's not totally devoid of hope. Because in verse 13, though the land is laid waste, the homes are deserted, the trees are cut down, there is a a stump from which a green shoot springs forth. See, God never wipes out his people totally. He, He cuts back the dead wood, he prunes the dead branches, but he ensures that there will be a stump that will remain. See, in the immediate context, there will be a faithful remnant that will return from exile back to the promised land. 
But in the wider context of the Bible, this stump is the Lord Jesus. And everybody who comes to faith in him, because it's from him that life springs forth. I mean, this is why he came. This is what he came to do, and this is what he's doing in the world. He is making dead hearts come alive to God through him. Because Jesus is the true vision of God. I mean, you might say to me, Adam, I'm I'm never going to have a vision of God like Isaiah did. And I would say, no, you've got something better. You've got the vision of God given to us in Jesus. Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's who our God is, and that's what it means to meet him, to put your faith and your trust in Jesus. And so what's your response to Jesus? The one who is full of grace and truth, the one who shows us the glory of God. This is what matters more than anything else. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this vision that you gave to Isaiah. Thank you that from it we see that you are a God who is holy, 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 totally above and beyond everything and everyone else. And yet you are also a God who descends and reveals yourself and your glory through your Son, the Lord Jesus. And he came to live the life that we have failed to live. The one with the whole pure heart lived a life for us, those with cracked hearts, so that we could receive healing and forgiveness and restoration. And so whether we walked in here today with a small view of you, God, I ask and I pray that you would enlarge it, help us to see reality. Help us to look through the telescope of your word to see how magnificent and glorious you are. And help us to behold and to put our trust in Jesus. The Lamb who was slain for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Lord. We don't deserve it and yet you freely give it to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand for this closing blessing? May the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, who has loved you with an everlasting love and gives you everlasting life, now support you with everlasting arms today and all your days until Jesus comes.